It's really nice to see you all. Thanks for coming tonight. This is um, such a brilliant event I've been looking forward to for a long time. It's a book that's close to my heart and I'm sure obviously because you're here obviously close to all of your heart as well um, and thank you for being here to come and listen to what will no doubt be a very thought-provoking and hopefully galvanizing conversation between um, between Ed and Anushka. So Ed wrote the Ed Gillespie wrote the foreword for the book and Anushka is the author of this wonderful book and she if you don't know who she is she's a psychoanalyst and a writer and passionately concerned about the effect of the climate crisis on our mental health, which I'm sure all of us are somewhat thinking about at the moment. Um, and I met Anushka almost exactly a year ago, actually, um, and invited her to meet me for coffee, where I asked her if she could write a book for me. And, um, and I had a feeling that she would infuse the book with exactly what this topic needs, a sort of not afraid to face the hard stuff and actually kind of lay it all out on the table for us, but also interlaced with a lot of humour and most importantly a sense of real compassion for humanity and the planet so a real sort of sense of what we all need to do a glimpse of the progress that we could make if we all take a bit of action and she's done such a brilliant book with this a brilliant uh, job for this amazingly powerful book and i'm very proud and grateful for her all of her hard work and Ed is going to be talking and asking questions um, today. Now, Ed Gillespie, he is a director of Greenpeace uh, and he's a podcaster at The Great Humbling and one half of The Future Noughts, which is a podcast which helps us all to imagine and build a better future. So it's not about keeping calm and carrying on. It's about getting excited and doing things, which is exactly, is exactly the sort of measure of what eco, the guide to eco-anxiety is all about. Ed has been a public speaker and a writer, poet on environmental issues, which he shares on Twitter, so I definitely recommend seeking him out, um, and an entrepreneur and investor in ethical business for over 20 years. And he is, like we all are, no doubt, ecologically anxious. So let's, without further ado, I'm going to hand over the, the stage to Ed and Anushka, and I can't wait to hear what you guys have in store for us. So enjoy, everyone. Fantastic. Okay, um, so thank you, Anya, uh, and good evening, everyone. Um, we're also joined by Jimmy the dog, uh, and possibly by Meg the cat, who may be making a guest appearance at, at some point. But um, yes, Anya sort of set the scene by saying, you know, we are all feeling this sort of sense of ecological anxiety. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed the book when I read it, and it provoked and and challenge me to be able to address some of my own thinking and mm. I think for me having been someone who spent a long time two decades as a sort of um, optimist a climate optimist mm. um, it really hit a raw nerve that I think I'd been sort of wrestling with thin, since the intergovernmental panel on climate change report in, mm. in October 2018 mm -hmm. which I think for those of us who've been in the movement for a long time was a real sense check mm. it was a real sort of yeah. line in the sand it's like, like yeah. this really this really isn't working out very well yes um yeah. and whatever happens next mm. is not going to be smooth yeah. but um as we can kick off Anishka, mm. you know should we just try and define what um eco anxiety is I mean, yeah know. i mean yeah but as you know it's kind of difficult because it manifests differently in different people so in yeah. a way there's a real classic archetypal one that I see all the time in my work is more like um, sort of eco insomnia or something that's what people yeah. describe over and over again lying in bed awake just thinking oh fuck you know the things are burning you know mm. insects are dying everything's just and nobody's doing anything about it and it's completely overwhelming but for other people I suppose it's more like a sort of background hum a kind mm. of but but it might leave you feeling a bit sort of depleted or it's yeah it sort of seems to be different from case to case and, and, and is there a difference between the idea or the feeling of fear and anxiety? How would you sort of, you know, describe yeah. those two different emotions? Because obviously they're, yeah. they're not the same. Yeah, that's such a good one. Because I, I mean, the classic definition is that fear is of a certain threat and anxiety is of an uncertain threat. And the weird thing about the climate crisis is that you could say, well, by now, actually, the threat's quite certain. So we mm. probably should be calling it climate fear. Mm. but we're not <laughs> yeah. it's funny because we always in my old agency we used to talk about um, like fear being a critical ingredient mm -hmm. in the communications mix yes. but we said it was like you know it should be like the seasoning in the recipe mm -hmm. so you know you 
if you put a, the right amount in, it yeah. enhances the dish and everyone mm -hmm. will eat. Yes. Um, but if you put too much in, yeah. you know, then it can just turn people off. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And what, what would you say about that sort of, that challenge about how do you prevent fear tipping us directly into sort of paralysis rather than, you know, actually galvanizing our part in this interaction? Yeah, I mean, that seems such a difficult thing. Yeah, sort of how would you put the information through in the absolutely perfect way for everyone and you can't. But I know there are those amazing studies, aren't there, like the film The Day After Tomorrow, mm -hmm. which is about this huge ecological catastrophe. And apparently after seeing that film, people were less worried about the future of you know, climate change. <laughs> so because they were so overwhelmed by what they'd seen and they were just like, no, actually it's not for them, don't worry. Yeah. So yeah, it seems to be a real problem. Well, that is our tendency, isn't it? Yeah. Because it's, you know, what is mine to change? What is mine to influence? And when it can mm -hmm. feel that climate change in particular is driven by every aspect of, of our lives, mm -hmm. that, you know, it's almost like, well, where do I begin? Yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I suppose, in a sense, you can't get it right. And so, you know, in the book, there's the chapter about how do you tell children about climate change? But in a sense, it's not that particular to children. It's how do you tell anyone that, you know, things are going quite badly at the moment without completely losing them, either to denial or to just collapse. And, and do you think eco-anxiety is, in this form, is unique to this generation? In the book, you make... Mm -hmm several references to the experience of Native Americans, mm. um, you know, because essentially they saw mm. the unravelling of their mm. way of life or, yeah. you know, the brutal destruction mm. and theft of their way of life mm. Mm. and their culture and mm. their environment basically destroyed around them yeah. um, by the pioneers. And, you know, if you've read Paul Kingsnall's book, The Wake, mm. where, you know, which is sort of set in Saxon England, mm -hmm you know, after the arrival of the Normans. Yeah, you know? yeah. And it was, you know, and his book is very powerful because it basically describes an mm. apocalypse. Yes. Because yes. the Saxon way of life was mm. totally, um, you know, dismembered by, mm. by the invading yes. knights uh, of Normans. So do, mm. you think, do you think what we're experiencing now is unique or is it, are there many parallels in history? Yeah, I guess, well, as you say, that there are lots of parallels in history. <laughs> um, I was like, almost, I mean, you know, like William Morris saw those people seeing the sort of, beginnings of industrialization mm. and the effects of that and the ways they were res responding to that. They, I, I guess they were suffering from some sort of form of eco-anxiety. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I guess in that sense, perhaps this is the first time it's truly global. Yeah. Because people would have felt it perhaps in a very localized way, mm. in a very intimate way, whereas yeah. now we're, we're all basically in the same boat. Yes, yeah, exactly. I mean, in, in a sense, isn't, isn't it crazy not to be worried? You know, to, to what extent, yeah. You know, do we, do we still see that level of denial? Because I mean, mm. a lot of a lot of the work I've been involved in, you know, was obviously talked mm. about addressing uh, the conventional form of climate denial, like mm. it's not happening. Yeah. But now I think we're sort of facing something mm. a little bit more insidious, which is sort of the denial of the severity of the threat, even by people who are activists in the movement. You yes. know, and obviously at one end of the spectrum, you've got extinction mm. rebellion. Mm. But at the other end, you have what we might call, you know, the sustainability industry, yes. which to a certain extent mm. is sort of co-opted yeah. by, by the machine and the system itself. Yes. Um, yeah. So and then it makes some ethical trainers and everyone will be okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know, yeah. I know. I mean, I, I, I tweeted something yesterday saying, um, you know, it's like, have you seen our new sustainability strategy? It means we can sell you expensive shit you don't need with zero impact. Uh, yeah. But, you know, there's still two fundamental flaws to that, <laughs> to that particular yeah. premise. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, there's so much that about. And, and, you know, and obviously XR's been in the news this week, and mm. I know you've been um, in contact and involved uh, mm. with them in some way, shape or form. So when Pretty Patel says, you know, Extinction Rebellion is a threat to our way of life, yeah. What do you think is the psychology of that? I don't, I mean, it's definitely shoot the messenger type thing, <laughs> but, but I suppose, I mean, it's weird the way everyone's using the language of each other or something. Like, I keep noticing that the, um, all the conspiracy theories and stuff going around at the moment, like QAnon or whatever, mm. in a sense, say the same things as the environmentalists. It's like, you've got to wake up, this thing is really happening just because you can't see it yeah. doesn't mean it's not real. And, and maybe having that sort of discourse alongside and kind of give them equal weight in some places. Mm. Donald Trump's like, yay, QAnon followers. 
you know, all right, dudes. <laughs> I don't know that. That how do you unpick? Like, because you, you can feel like a nutter as as an environmentalist sometimes, even if you're reading lots of scientific studies, and it yeah. seems quite well backed up. You know, you're still saying the end of the world's nigh, and people are still saying to you, "Don't be such a twit." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've been on the receiving yes. end of a few accusations like that. I'm yeah. sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so, how how do you kind of hold it? And so, when Pretty Patel says it's the environmentalists who are, you know, doing the damage rather than the terrible mm. trade deals that she's perfectly happy to watch go ahead in front of her. Mm. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, it's interesting. That, I mean. It, because if you go back to the etymology of conspiracy, it's mm. literally to breathe together. Right. You know, it yes. is, it is mm. trying to find a common breath. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean you go down a particularly healthy rabbit hole. Yeah. Um, but I think that the, the, the bigger question, perhaps, for you, and you, I know you touch on this a lot in the book, mm. is what, what happens when we, we start to feel this anxiety really deeply? You know, when you talk about the kind of amygdala, mm. the stress cycles and the cortisol, yeah. you know, what's the sort of physiological reaction and how does that affect our psychology when we, when we feel this anxiety so deeply? Yeah, this, this isn't my best thing because, you know, I'm a psychoanalyst and so right. all okay. that stuff is just, I learn it for the book and then right. I forget it. But, um, but it is, I mean, the body reacts to ideas, basically, and, and yeah. we all know that and that's not a sort of funny thing. <laughs> it's a proper thing and yeah. so if, if something terrifying is happening then the body reacts and so things like a, I don't know greater heart rate or sweating or shaking or mm. all those things can start happening to bodies when they're confronted with a really horrifying idea yeah. and so so it becomes yeah people get ill like it's totally exhausting to be dealing with the threat that isn't going away and actually is getting worse and and then you're reading you know Pretty Patel's latest or whatever and if you're already sweating and shaking about it and yeah. yeah. Because there's also something else that you touch on in the book which I think is really powerful around and maybe this is more of the psychoanalytical side of things but this idea of you know sort of death denial mm. and our immortality project mm. you know I mean you know we're pretty good obviously uh, mm. rejecting our own mortality yes and so when we're expanding that to a sort of existential crisis mm. at a civilizational level yeah do you think we are sort of collectively in that sort of death denial moment that we can't we can't yeah. actually acknowledge or engage with the fact that this is actually yes. a fundamental existential risk yeah yeah exactly that seems to be true and that's another you know sort of speculative idea but when you look at human behavior like if you show people really shocking ecological news items and then you study their responses to advertising or something in the break then you see people respond much more to luxury products after a big existential threat yeah. has been presented to them oh there's a thing in the book which, which I did find amazing, but the woman who said she was absolutely terrified of tunnels and she couldn't go to France because she couldn't go on Eurostar. And she found that if she put on a really big um, face of makeup on the train before it went into the tunnel, then she could face the tunnel. And it seems that every, you know, lots of people are caught up in basically doing that. I mean, variations. So we can face that. the apocalypse as long as we look good. Yeah, exactly. Like your house is in order, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've got a haircut. Yeah, and, and I mean, in, in the book, you talk a lot also about, I mean, and you just touched on the, the challenges for the messengers. Mm. Now, there's obviously a real responsibility, mm. and there has been an enormous responsibility disproportionately placed on the shoulders of climate scientists. Mm. You know, and I know from discussions over the last 20 years, mm. you know, when people saying, well, we've got to sort of sugar the pill somehow, mm. you know, you can't, um, you know, emphasize the disaster. Mm. We've got to be cautious about the uncertainty of the science, mm. which somehow has diluted the message. What, yes. what was your sense of the kind of psychoanalytical effects of what that has done to the climate scientists themselves as bearers of quite, you know, critically bad news. Yeah, isn't it that they're suffering from the kind of Cassandra effect, aren't they? Yeah. That they're driven mad by the fact that they actually know because they observe it and they cannot transmit the message to the people who need to hear it, people who yeah. could do something. And it's fine to transmit it even to members of the public who then feel powerless and don't know what to do. But the, the people who could actually do something about the way business is conducted, about you know, people in government or whatever, are the ones that it just keeps not landing with. Well, that, and that's what's so interesting, isn't it? Because if you, 
I mean, funny enough, tomorrow mm -hmm. we see the publication of mm -hmm. the UK's Climate Assembly report, mm -hmm. which is obviously you know the first consultative and, mm -hmm. and interactive process with mm -hmm. a representative demographic of the UK population. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be fascinating to see mm -hmm. to what it, what recommendations they have produced, yeah. because that's been for the first time actually people are getting a chance mm -hmm. to hear all the expert perspectives mm -hmm. in a cool, you know, dispassionate and very honest and, and yes. raw way. Yeah. And to start to make up their own minds about what we yeah. could or should all be doing. Yes. Um, yes. And, and I think it's been fascinating to, to, to see how radical yeah. they have been prepared to be because mm -hmm. we always have politicians who tell us, well, you know, the mm -hmm. radicalism that's required is completely unsellable. Yes. And Koki and Anne yeah, yeah, famously exactly. said, you know, every politician knows what they need mm. to do on climate change. Yeah. They just don't know how to get re-elected after they've done it. Yes, yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, so you can't just blame the politicians. It's the whole kind of, mm. yes, yeah, it's the maths and the politics and that. But there's a bit yeah. in your book, would you like to read it? A little bit about, <laughs> about the psychoanalysis of, of yeah. climate scientists. So. Okay, yeah, thank you. That was so the problem with much scientific writing on the climate was that it tried very hard to be unemotional and objective, but this meant that the writers often found themselves putting forward the most apocalyptic ideas in the coolest terms, afraid that any hint of panic on their part would undermine their credibility. The last thing the scientists wanted was to be accused of being hysterical or alarmist. On the one hand, it might make people less likely to trust them, not to mention putting them in the firing line of corporations who saw the honest reporting of the science as an attack on their ways of conducting business. On the other, it might make people give in altogether. So it's like, oh, well, if the scientists say we're fucked, then we might as well have a party on the way out. All of which apparently left many of the scientists feeling understandably freaked out. They were the very people in a position to do or say something that might actually make a difference, but they were being thwarted at the last step, unable to articulate clearly the effects they were seeing unfold before their eyes. Another perfect example of the madness built into the global reaction to climate change. You couldn't simply say what you were seeing because there was apparently no longer any such thing as a simple fact. The facts were already political. If you dared to suggest that people might need to drive less, fly less, frack less, and so on, you risk being called a controlling, envious lefty with no place in the hypermodern, super free, fantastically fun world. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and it, but it's also interesting how quickly this can all change as well. I mean, I remember yeah. sitting in a Greenpeace board meeting a couple of years ago. Um, maybe a bit longer ago, three or four years ago, mm -hmm. but talking about how we felt we couldn't go after people's diet. Yes. You know, we couldn't necessarily mm -hmm. go on the front foot. And obviously mm -hmm. now, with That's, the rise of veganism happens. and meat yeah. and, you know, conspiracy, yeah. and suddenly it's mm -hmm. actually quite a populist yeah. agenda. And, and we've seen totally. it taken yeah. up very widely in a way that yes. would have been un unheard of four or yeah. five years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's funny and that, that people are happy to do it. So actually, it's pretty. Yeah. I mean, the people who are happy to do it are happy to do it. Yes. <laughs> but there are lots of us. And there's a therapeutic yeah. question there, isn't there? Mm. In terms of, you know, with, with, if you were taking, you know, the planet as an individual client mm. or mm. patient, um, and, and there's a sort of an element of having to face the challenge of the truth, yeah. which is there in the essence mm. of Extinction Rebellion's tell mm. the truth and act like it's real. Yes. I still think is a very powerful, you know, as a, person who worked in professional communications for a long time, it's a very powerful yeah. frame to sort of go, as long as it doesn't spill into the conspiratorial type of territory. Yeah. But to what extent do you think sort of therapeutically we have these sort of pacifying myths mm. of te techno-utopianism, that mm. you know, just yes. just one more technological push, yeah. you know, you know we'll yeah. just a bit more mm. renewable energy, just a mm. few more electric cars, just mm. a little bit more lab-grown meat, you know, yes. and everything will be hunky dory. I mean, yeah. to what extent do you think that's just a more sophisticated form of denial, yeah. a narrative that we construct for ourselves to yes. justify it? Yeah, that, that seems to be true. But that's the one that people will come back at you really forcefully if you try to argue that. It's like, come on, they're fixing it. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. But I thought in psychoanalysis, the thing of time, you have to time your interventions really well. Yeah. Like, you, you might have the idea that that person's problem is this, but you can't just say it to that person. So you kind of have to wait and wait and wait until you think they're ready to hear it. And I guess with climate change, like the thing you're saying with diet, sometimes there's the right moment and, you know, something gets hit and people mm. go for it. But when you're being told, well, 2018, there were 12 years. <coughs> 
10 years to go. It's like, when is it going to be possible to say something in a way it's going to hit? Yeah, I mean, you also touch on the Australian fires in the book. Mm. It was just written, wasn't it, just yeah. as that was happening. Mm. Um, and I think there's something really interesting, again, extending that sort of pacifying myths mm. sort of moment. Mm. Um, and, and I did a workshop on the Bank of England in January this year. Mm. We were talking about the three comfortable myths we tell ourselves mm. about non-linear climate risk. Mm. You know, right. and Australia yes. was burning at the time. Yeah. Um, and we were saying, you know, the myths are, we know what's going on. Mm. We think we're in control. Yeah. And we have the right forms of leadership mm. in order to be able to, to deal mm. with what's happening. Yes. And actually the uncomfortable truth is mm. we don't know what's no, going on. Right. Yeah. We are certainly not in control. Mm. Um, you know, our leadership has been found wanting mm. You know, yeah. in many respects and then obviously immediately after that we were talking about non-linear climate risk mm. um the sort of exponential effects mm. when you get these mega fires yes. rubbing out of control mm. we were talking about economic crises and mm. we also mentioned pandemics right um well, yeah. slightly sort of far-sightedly yeah and then we and then we've got all three so mm. to what extent do you think going back to what you were saying about interventions mm. actually things like the Australian fires mm. and, you know, and California wildfires yes. and the Amazon fires which are burning right now yeah. um, and even to a certain extent the pandemic are yes. the sort of interventions which might make us. You would us think, yes exactly and I suppose for lots of people they are aren't they but that's the tragedy of exile this week and last isn't it that they're like come on you've seen it now so yeah. now we have to go and but they're meeting this kind of like what are you doing this for now we're trying to get the economy back on track don't you know yeah. everyone's lost their job shut up yeah. and, you know whatever and so I, I don't know what people are supposed yeah. to do. And, and in that sense do you think that that is because we can't engage. We find it very hard to engage with the sense of grief and loss yeah. that it is in, inherent in this. Because, yeah. um, you know, I, mean, I, I just, just on the biodiversity and the ecology mm. front, yeah. you know, I started my career out in, in fisheries, mm. and, um, you know, realising you're going to spend your whole career saying, if you don't stop catching all the fish, there won't be any fish. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, right. But also that we've lost half of our sort of big vertebrates yeah. um, in my lifetime, yes. since 1970, half of them have gone. Yes, yes. Um, mm. So if we don't engage with that sense yeah. of grief and loss, mm. then we're not confronting the reality, yeah. are we? So yeah. we are still sort of layering on the denial. I mean, what, mm. what other therapeutic techniques might we deploy to try and encourage people to face that awkward and uncomfortable truth. Yeah, I suppose, I mean, one of the big things, I suppose, in all, lots of different forms of psychotherapy and psychoanalysis is something to do with uncertainty yeah. and being able to tolerate uncertainty. And, and just to say that, that I don't know, that, that loss is really terrible and there's something about loss that you haven't fully experienced yet or you haven't experienced directly, but you kind of know about it conceptually. Mm. Or those things are really difficult to grasp. So I guess those things are easy to duck out of. Mm. And the whole thing of timing around it, like this idea of um, sort of preemptive mourning, because it's you don't know if you're mourning for what you've already lost or what you haven't lost yet, or that, that how people situate themselves in it is really, really complex so I suppose yeah kind of being open to that and being able to bear the uncertainty of that is just really really hard that is a lot to ask of people yeah. people I, traditionally don't yeah. like that no I mean I think I can't remember it's you who coined it but the sort of it's not it's not post-traumatic stress disorder mm. this is sort of pre-traumatic stress condition yeah that's Lee's fan sister and this psychiatrist who I think she worked with the climate change scientists and she just kept seeing it over and over again yeah because yeah. you know you can see what's coming down the tracks because yeah. I you know I, I think you know the, the angle you're coming at we, we will also open this up to questions from the audience by the way we're getting oh, yeah. we, we've sort of forgotten you're there we're just getting into this I know. Uh, I'm so excited <laughs> to see everyone's faces I want to see them again. Um, no worries guys I have questions ready for you okay, okay. Well, I've, got yeah. a, I've got a couple more I'm going to hog Anushka just for a couple more minutes um, because there's something here about I think the transformative power of grief and you mm. talk about it just a reminder guys please mute your your uh microphones when joining the call oh is that okay. joshua <laughs> <laughs> he's in the car 
because there's something about that transformative power of and and seeing it as genuinely transformative. And I touched yeah. on it before, but mm. like, you know, I, I think environmentalists have been reluctant to go mm. yes. close to that grief. Yeah. Whereas maybe, and it's interesting again if you look at what the messaging around COVID has been. Mm. You know, it hasn't been the sort of happy, clappy, hopeful optimism. Mm. Uh, you know, it's actually been quite yeah. blunt. You yes. know, yeah. it's like. People are going to die, mm. you know, and a yeah. lot of people are going to die mm. really quickly. Uh, mm. and, and actually, mo most of us, you know, yeah. sucked that up, didn't we? Yes. And we just sort of went, oh, okay, well, mm. we, 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 we will respect the lockdown. Mm. And in a sense, that kind of global solidarity, mm. for me, was quite an inspiring moment. Yes, so. yeah. Yeah, totally. But I, do you think there's something as well? It's sort of all the ethical, philosophical problems around risk and and kind of well, bad things happening that, that often when bad things actually happen people find really sort of ways to cope that are amazing and act, learn a lot and and sort of get a lot out mm. of tragedy but that doesn't mean you want tragedy so no. but this whole kind of paradox of trying to stave off this mega tragedy at the same time as telling people well bad things actually are going to happen they're happening already and there will you know there are ways to cope with those things or to sort of ameliorate something around that stuff so it's not just either we save the planet or it's just awful for everyone <laughs> but then you know it looks like there probably is going to be some kind of intermediate state where yeah. a lot of bad things happen, there's going to be huge displacements, it's going to be bad, yeah. but that doesn't mean everything's lost. And that's not to be callous, because it sounds so callous to say that you might find good things in that, so don't give up, don't give up. <laughs> and, and, and that's right, isn't it? I mean, that's where the sort of the hope comes from mm. a, a form of transcendence. Yeah. I mean, Rebecca Solomon in the mm. Paradise Made in Hell mm -hmm. writes beautifully yeah. about it, when she mm. visited you know, a number of different mm. disaster struck and yeah. stricken communities. Mm. And, you know, I think, and, and, and Rutger Bregman has also mm. touched on humankind. I don't know if you've read his latest no, book. No. But he said, you know, the ideology that, mm. you know, we're all red in tooth and claw and that mm. we're inherently selfish and that yeah. when push comes to shove, it's going to be Mad Max. Yeah. You know, and, as, and actually, the, all the it's evidence suggests. In, in any way. No. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know, mm. it says we saw that with COVID, didn't we? Yeah. The mutual aid networks and everyone, mm. you know, there's a sort of selflessness to it. Yeah. You know, um, I guess we're seeing a little bit of a backlash now with mm. you know, some of the sort of marches yes. in London. You yes, know, I and think the, yeah. Refusal to wear masks. And, <laughs> yes. and, and perhaps that's inevitable. But, mm. you know, the, certainly the vast majority seem to have been actively on board and engaged. Yes, yeah, exactly. Exactly. But it's such a difficult thing, like like with uh, American Indians and, and this idea that, well, they've done it somehow. They've done this thing that we're going to have to do. And the kind of paradox of the people who did it to them saying, hang on, tell us what you did. <laughs> it's, it's, it's rude. But, um, but yeah, we are going to have to perform quite extraordinary operations, I would say, internal operations to just bear yeah. it. And, no, I mean, I've, just, I've described it as an extraordinary emergency requires an extraordinary emergence. Yeah, you know, yeah. From, from us. Yeah. It's like, we ain't going to fix this or tackle mm. this with the, the usual tools and tactics of behavioural psychology. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a, something a bit more emotional and philosophical. Yeah, uh, yeah. That needs to happen. Exactly. Yeah. And do you, because just because I'm an atheist or whatever, but not a proud one or a dogmatic one, but when I find myself talking like this, I think, oh my God, Mishka, you really sound like you're a religious maniac. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think there is, I mean, yeah, maybe I am. <laughs> well, when, before before yeah. I was a recovering sustainability consultant, you know, mm. we always used to joke that sustainability is a bit of a cult. Yeah. Because you can end up sounding completely yes. evangelical. Yeah, you know, exactly. And you're only one step away from the sandwich board. Yeah. You know, so yes. <laughs> Half a step, yes. Yeah. I mean, let's let's open it up because I'm sure um, there are loads of questions coming in. So, Laura, um, can you host some questions from the crowd? I did. So, so the first question is from John Collins. He says there are so many different axes of anxiety. Should we treat them all the same? Anxiety raised by COVID-19, for example, is hard to disassociate from eco-anxiety and other bad stimuli. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I'd say that the people that I work with who were already suffering from eco-anxiety responded to COVID in a completely different way to, to people who aren't particularly phased by what's going on with the climate. And, and for a lot of people, it is interesting in psychoanalysis. I know we've got lots of shrinks on the bar at the top. <laughs> but I mean, some people just, you know, went over to Zoom, but just carried on talking about whatever they were talking about before, <laughs> whereas other people were kind of floored by it. And it seems, yeah, that's why working with people, you know, keeping the idea of people's subjectivity and particularity is really, really important in all of this, that it's not kind of one way to handle it. There's not sort of do this, do this, do this, but it's, you know, we keep being human and we keep being complex. And that's what's awful about it is that you don't stop being mm. human. In yeah emergency <laughs> but, no yeah. <laughs> we've always had COVID-19 is, mm. is basically the planet saying to humanity now go back to your room mm. and think carefully about what you've done yes and as you say some people just went on zoom and carried on regardless. yeah, yeah it's <laughs> but I mean it's kind of good for them anyway. yeah. <laughs> thank you yeah Laura another one perfect so um from Clive Ed mentioned loss and grief. Are we not constantly faced with this individually? And is it not hubristic to think that despite our best efforts, we will eventually become extinct? Should have read Overcome Extinction, i.e. Death. Yeah, I think, isn't the problem, it's to do with anthropogenic climate damage, because obviously everybody knows that, that you know, the planet's moving towards the sun, um, at a certain speed and, and we, it's a finite thing and we're all individually going to die and so I don't think it's some sort of fantastic human exceptionalism we're so marvellous we've got to preserve ourselves because we're great but you know we are taking a lot of other life forms down mm. with us and and so it's just about stopping doing that like stopping um, human cause destruction mm. on a mass mass scale. I think it's also about yeah. I mean for me it's also about suffering yeah. Uh, I did a workshop with uh, a bunch of climate scientists at Cambridge University a few mm. years back and it was the topic of the workshop was how to communicate mm. difficult climate messages mm. and we had sort of two days of presentations mm. of you know what a six degree world would look like mm. and, you know by the end of day two everyone was like oh, just, you know kill me now yeah um, but then a scientist stood up at the end and said something which really stayed with me and he said you know it is about alleviation of suffering mm -hmm. and not just about the damage to ecology. Mm -hmm. It's like every ton of carbon that doesn't go into the atmosphere now alleviates future human suffering in some way, shape, or yes, form. Yeah. So that, and again, that's about a quality of mm -hmm. life and a quality of experience. Isn't yes, it? yeah. Exactly. You know, so it doesn't matter if the end is death yeah. or ultimately extinction. It's mm -hmm. like, it's like there, are, there are ways of going through this with dignity and respect, yeah. and there are ways of going at it, you know, in yes. a sort of act of mad vandalism. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And also, isn't it, I suppose in answer to that question, there is the question of justice too, mm. that the people who are benefiting yeah. from the destruction are probably thinking they're going to be fine because they're going to get a climate proof apartment or they're going to move to an island or, you know, whatever. They, they feel buffered against it and it's the people who can't protect themselves because they don't have the means to do it yeah. who are going to suffer. So it's not just, you know, you cause the suffering and you suffer. It's displaced onto other people. So yeah. it's just an extraordinary injustice. No. And I was just reading a paper this morning, um, which was saying that those nations, as you say, that are least responsible for climate change are the ones mm. going to be hit hardest. Yeah. They also tend to be the ones which are already more violent and mm. unstable. Yeah. And also we have a fairly linear relationship between mm. temperature and violence. Actually, yes. as temperatures go up, mm. people become more aggressive mm. um, as, a, as a general rule. Right. <laughs> Okay, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, you know, that's also a, kind of yeah. a disturbing, you know, mm. prospect for a war. Mm. Yeah. We're getting into the dark stuff. Um, <laughs> Laura, any more uh, dark questions? Jimmy's protesting. Yeah. We have quite a few. So, um, from Alex, the most successful historical movements for positive change all appear to have been much more motivated by hope and desire for better than by loss, mourning, and despair. For example, Martin Luther King didn't say, I have a nightmare. How far are inspiring visions of the better sustainable future a cure for eco-anxiety? Yeah, I mean, I think those things are definitely super helpful, like the lovely documentary 2040, <laughs> just showing that there are things that we already have now, technologies that are in place that could be used, that are brilliant, that could make an enormous difference. And, and so, yeah, hope has to be a huge part of what you present 
people with. But, but um, we've got quite a sort of short window mm -hmm. in which to make quite a big difference. And I think, that, you know, there is the possibility that people might, you know, be asked to make sacrifices like changing mm -hmm. their diets or driving less or, you know, not buying tons of fast fashion or, you know, those little changes that, that individuals might be able to make en masse, which might make a difference. And, and that um, giving people a reason to do it, which might involve telling them a bit about why it's a good idea to do it. I mean, I think, yeah, just being positive, I, I think it, we've slightly crossed the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think also, I mean, my friend John Alexander from the New Citizenship Project um, said this quite sharply a few years ago. He said, we, are, we, we oversimplify Martin Luther King's mm. speech. Mm. Because actually, if you read the text of the I Have a Dream speech, everyone remembers that part yeah, of it. Yeah, yeah. But actually, the bulk of that text mm. is pretty dark. Yeah. You know, I mean, the rallying cry is mm. there is a vision of the future which is far better, more attractive mm. and compelling that yes. we should be striving towards. But much That's of that speech is actually yeah. talking about mm. the, the horror of injustice and lynching mm. um, and, you know, the ongoing um, putting down of, of yeah. people of colour yes. uh, in the States. So, mm. you, you know, it's... Yes. It's, it's not mis it's not misquoting him, but yeah. it's to say he wasn't just about a positive vision. He was mm -hmm. also prepared to talk about the, the difficult short term reality in which people found themselves. Yes, yeah. And I think if people are able to bear difficult truths, people do it all the time, you know, mm. in their lives, in their families, in you know, all sorts of situations. So did you see that piece in the Guardian mm. yesterday where the 31 year old guy who's got terminal cancer? Mm. I mean it's just it's one of those articles, you know, he, mm. he's he's going to die. Mm. He's probably got weeks or months. Mm. But it's such a profoundly beautiful piece of writing. Right. This is what yeah. I, this is the truth I want to share. Mm. You know, and mm. and he's Describe the fact that he's had a great life, yeah. even, even though he knows it's been, mm. in some sense, prematurely curtailed. Yeah. It's full of gratitude and appreciation mm. uh, and affection. Yes. Um, yeah. uh, and, and it's quite wonderful. Mm. Recommended read. <laughs> Thanks, guys. So this question is from Victoria Hall. How do those of us whose career is in communicating about sustainability way through the noise, political, commercial, etc., and help affect actual tangible behavior change in the public. Do we tap into that anxiety, even though research has shown us that it can be a barrier to behavior change rather than a motivation? Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's a proper and difficult question, but it does seem, I mean, the people who are anxious shouldn't be, it, I don't think anxiety is only, um, what do you call it, only inhibiting or whatever. And mm. that's what the book's about in a sense, that there, there are two ways <laughs> to be anxious. And even in the dictionary, it, it tells you there's, there's a sort of a way of being anxious that scuppers you and a way of being anxious, which is to do with a willingness to act. Mm. And so if, if people are anxious, um, because they're concerned, then that can be a, a motivating thing, or, or it can be crippling. And so, so how can we start speaking about all this stuff w without obscuring the truth? Like, let it, as you say, letting enough of the truth out so that people can bear to hear it, while keeping people on the side of a kind of willingness to act rather than a kind of fatalism. And, and giving up and I think yeah I suppose you have to communicate very carefully and expect there to have to be a lot of communication <laughs> like that seems to be something that, that research shows that, that when people talk about it and they talk about it in groups and they feel okay to talk about it to their friends and the climate cafes if they mm. want to do that or they belong to a, a group if they don't like XR then they belong to another group or but but that having some kind of um, space for articulating things and acting is is really really helpful and, and I, I mean I would add to that in saying yeah I, I mean, that's, that's a question that I've wrangled yeah you must have. my whole yeah, career yes <laughs> um, yeah and where I'm at now is I think you know, you do need to talk the hard truths, but you have mm. to, I think you have to somehow connect them to the heart um, in a more powerful, yeah. more powerful way. And mm. I think that's where the compassion can come through. That's where the connection can come through. Mm. Um, and it requires a maturity. I don't, mm. I don't think this is about conducting an orchestra of behavior change. Yeah. Uh, you know, as yeah. I said, I think it's something, and I hesitate to use the word soulful, but mm. maybe spirited is, yes. is a better way of, uh, of talking about it. Mm. because you know when you 
if you, if you take something which is highly politically emotive at the moment, mm. like, you know, desperate refugees crossing the channel, mm. you know, and I was, I was quite horrified by the poll the other week, which said, you know, 49% mm. mm. of Britain said they didn't care. Yeah. Now that to me speaks like a kind of mm. a, a chronic collective compassion failure. Yeah. Um, and doesn't bode well when the, when the mm. trickle of people crossing the channel now yes. is only, you know, inevitably yeah, that's going to stopping. get bigger. Yes. Yeah. It's not stopping. Mm. And, you know, and there's many of us who've been warning about this for, mm. for a long time. Mm. And so I, I do think we have to try and, and talk more directly to the heart yeah. um, and more directly to, to people's sense of, of common mm. humanity, because that, that is the key to unlocking, yeah. whether it's COVID, mm. whether it's civil rights and Black Lives Matter, whether mm. it's climate change. Mm. I think there's, there's very similar connections with all of these, whether yeah. it's about a comfortable myth we tell ourselves about mm. colonialism or you know, our mm. own individual resistance yes. to, a, to a novel virus, or, mm. or the fact that we could potentially build a wall to protect ourselves from climate change. Yeah, Paul yeah. Dickinson from the Carbon Disclosure Project tells a great story about being in a taxi, you know, talking to the ta black cab driver about, mm. uh, about climate change. He was getting the usual scepticism and mm. he said, well, um, what about your kids? And the guy basically jammed on the brakes, mm -hmm. turned around and said, my kids will be fine. Really? Yeah. And he right. said, you know, that's the thing. People don't, mm. people don't make the bigger than self connection. They somehow think that they're going to muddle through and be okay. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And it's terrible if environmentalism either falls into the thing of, you know, a kind of the set of consumer choices that are really rigorously policed. That's just completely know, bullshit. <laughs> or, or, or the other one, like forget it as an individual. It's nothing. You can't do anything. Nothing you do yeah. or choose is going to have any effect at all it's bigger powers than you so no. you're going to have to affect those bigger powers but how are you going to do it <laughs> no, it's the paradox it's of ethical consumption yeah um, which uh, we could we could spend another hour on um laura another question please you guys have tons of questions coming in from from all of the attendees by the way everybody attending phenomenal questions i'm so impressed um so this one is from uh charles Charles Ross, having read the text and enjoyed it, lots of good takeaways. The case with buying, of buying Adidas trainers in so much of the clothing that we buy for uh, hedonic reasons, I can speak, um, is surely better than other indulgences. The risk that we run is removing all enjoyment from life which would be a popular standpoint to win over the, the masses. Surely getting the majority to get moving, even their first step, is getting them to recognize where we are is bad, plus it would have a better overall effect than just getting the hardcore to improve even more. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I, I mean, yeah. I agree. Yeah, exactly, right. that's right. I like the, the zero waste chef or whatever. She's saying you don't want to get a handful of people kind of doing zero waste perfectly. Mm -hmm. You want to get a lot of people doing it imperfectly. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, being a kind of perfect, I don't know, green consumer is, is fine, but it's not, not really what it's about. But if everybody's engaged, like you say, if everybody kind of felt it, yeah. I mean, it's not about anti-consumption per se, I don't think. I mean, again, you talk about this in the book, uh, you know, towards the end when you're talking about actions. Mm. When, you know, the best things in life are, are carbon-free. Yeah. Um, and I think we've also learned this during lockdown, haven't mm. we, a little mm. bit? Because the things we really missed, mm. you know, because you could carry on online shopping. <laughs> yes, you know, yeah. but the things you missed were mm. human contact, yeah. the interaction, the ability to go outdoors mm. and you know, connect with nature whenever you wanted. Yeah. Those are the things I think that people found really mm. suffocating yes. um, and were really anxiety inducing. And mm. So there's a sense of uh, appreciation around those. And I, mm. I mean, I love what you wrote about how you find joy. Mm. Uh, in what can f sometimes feel like hopelessness. Mm. And it was actually quite simple things, wasn't right. it? Sort of, yeah. I mean, as, as Charles has intimated, mm. you know, it's like getting some exercise, breathing, yes. singing, yeah. the, you called it the charisma of birds, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah. and yeah. friendliness and wild generosity. Mm. I think, you know, we know psychologically mm. that actually doing things for other people, you know, altruism yeah. makes Gives us you feel a lot. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, exactly. But I suppose, yeah, all that sort of selflessness and it's, 
in a way, it's the easiest thing to sell to people, I think, because that's yeah. what most Hollywood films are about, is yeah. like how to be <laughs> selfless, how to give things up, let things go, you know, whatever. It's, you just see it everywhere, how to be generous, how to put someone's life ahead of your own. And yeah. like, we, we love all that, basically. But yeah, telling people, because the, the counter narrative, the red and tooth and claw is also really potent. Mm. And well, which, which narrative do you buy? Or, well, you hear that from yeah. the back of furlough, don't you? Where yeah. politicians are already starting to say, well, we can't continue furlough because people mm. get used to getting something for nothing. Yes, yes. Yeah. You know, it's like we're back to the unworthy poor again. Yeah, you know, yeah. Who, exactly. who, who won't work. Mm. Um, well, Laura, if you've got lots of questions, let's. I, I have tons. And actually, I'm going to uh, ask you guys two more. And I just wanted to let everybody know that I have cataloged all of your questions and I'm going to send them to Anushka and Ed. So anything that isn't answered, we can have answered via a blog post or a separate recorded interview, something for you later, um, just to make sure that, that all of your questions are addressed. Um, so I really like this one from Hannah. She says, Anushka, I'm wondering how you respond to clients who bring to your clinic what might appear to be a universal anxiety about an issue, such as the climate emergency or the pandemic, in a way that while holding that is a universal set of conditions to some extent, manages also to look at the specificity of what it means to that person. Yeah, exactly. That's such a good question. Yeah, perfect. Because that is what the difficulty of the work is in the clinic. But I think that's also what the difficulty of the work is in the world. That, that, that especially if somebody comes in just saying that they can't sleep because of the state of the world, they're angry, they're upset, they're, you know, furious with politicians, then, then if you start to question that, you have to be really careful because you don't want that person to think you're a climate denier and you think they're just being neurotic or whatever. But it's also true that that person is going to be bringing their whole history and their whole set of associations to the things that are upsetting them so so it's sort of bound to be true that their you know relation to say you know male politicians is partly informed by their relationship with their dads or you know their idea that of resources running out might be you know in relation to whatever their, their family um economics or whatever it was they grew up with or their mum or you know food <laughs> so so those kind of really visceral personal subjective associations are really really important and in terms of helping people maybe to suffer less or bear things more I think tying the two together often works really well or helps people a lot so they say <laughs> I don't know. but um yeah that you stop seeing it it's sort of you you see your subjectivity in it somehow you you don't just see a big thing happen a big sublime thing happening to you but but you inhabit that thing as yourself and then you see what you can do perfect I hope that I'm pronouncing this person's name right and my apologies if I'm not but but uh, Sionav Lafferty um, had a wonderful comment she said thank you Nishka and Ed I'm really grappling with this concept of our species being inherently self-interested Aristotle versus uh, Freud versus Hobbes versus Rousseau. Finding my tribe and feeling connected is an important coping mechanism to me. At the same time, a rising volume of literature is telling us that we need to develop shared values that support social and environmental justice to move forward. Do you think the, sh the trauma, shock, threat, et cetera, of climate collapse is enough for people to change or redirect their personal values and therefore behavior? Yeah, that, well that's, that's super difficult. But the one thing I read about that that I thought was really brilliant was in the Radical Hope, this Jonathan Lear mm. book where he writes a lot about um, American Indians and how they've responded to the things mm. that they've lost. And he, he's psychoanalytic and he says at one point that, that everybody at birth, in a sense, experiences um, a form of radical hope in that, that when you're born you're just utterly helpless and you land in the arms of others and, and then what they those others do next to ensure your survival or not is is what makes you who you are but in a sense everybody's kind of 
first primal experience is, is one of radical hope. And, and the fact that we're here at all, you know, if, if you didn't die, that means somebody responded to you, that somebody took care of, of something for you. And so, so, you know, that's got to be deeply there in people. And of course, rivalry is, is a sort of huge part of the human makeup and, and we compare ourselves. And in a sense, we, I, we become human by identifying, by copying, by competing and, you know, all of the, that social stuff. But that that um, hope around a connection and that that kind of I don't know possibility of exchange and protection is is so intrinsic to, to what a person is that um, yeah I think people shouldn't give up on it or, or think it's a sort of unlikely outcome or that that people will do something good. <laughs> no, I certainly hope it's the case, I and mean, yeah. I think it's like. Every intelligent civilization will at some point butt up against the limits yeah. of its planet, yeah. and it's almost like the proving ground. Mm -hmm. It's like it's how you react when you mm -hmm. bump up against those limits. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I wrote a blog once about Fermi's paradox. You know, mm -hmm. it's like why is there no other intelligent life that we found? And you know, one of the mm -hmm. theories is that you know, most civiliz intelligent civilizations will reach this type of bottleneck, mm -hmm. and most of them don't make don't it. Do very well. <laughs> don't yeah. Make it yeah. When they get there. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, it must be possible to transcend. And, yes. you know, for me, that comes back to it's not about sustainability because mm. I think I've increasingly come to the conclusion, well, what are we trying to sustain here? Mm. You know, this yeah. sort of juggernaut of runaway economic growth which eats the planet, mm. you know, or are we trying to sustain us and the wider family of life yes. in, a, in a way which makes ecological sense yeah. uh, and, with, and with respect? Mm. And so... I do think, you know, we might have to break a few things in order mm. to get that transcendence. Yes, uh, I yeah. mean, Not in a sort of Facebook way, move fast and break things. No, um, yeah. But like the thing that the idea that to live like an average American would take, um, if everybody on earth mm. at the moment lived like an average American, it would take six planets to, yeah. to sustain everybody and, and you can't have that. And at the moment that means, well, a lot of people are living on a lot less than they need. <laughs> and <clears throat> yeah, so distribution is a huge problem, but just the idea that everybody will sort of come up to the American standard and that's mm. the a brilliant idea of whatever post-industrial capitalism it's not really a good idea so in, in, in short answer to your question Hannah we really hope so <laughs> yes um, so I think that we have time for one more question um, and I'm I'm gonna pull this one from Antonia because it's it's an early one um, with a combination of one from Giselle and John as well so Antonia asked, how do we get the balance right? We have to raise awareness, but without scaring the living daylights out of everyone and somehow be taken seriously at the same time. Do we have to just work with the lowest hanging fruit? And then Gisela and John also wanted to add in, could working creatively on a project expressing, say, love for the world help anxiety? Yeah. That, thanks, Gisela and John, that was really nice. But, um, but I wonder, I mean, just, I don't know, looking at Ed, because he's been working on environmentalism what, for two decades mm. and, and sort of, but here's what, the, the worst stuff, I mean, here's the prognoses and mm. really is faced with the horror consistently. <clears throat> and I mean, you're still here, like you've survived that. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and let, I mean, yeah, so how? <laughs> um. I, mean, I think it does come back partly to your sense of radical hope. Mm. But I, mean, I think the other aspect of the question was, right, you know, how do you draw people towards something? I mean, mm. the fact is, you know, there is a lot and a lot more attractive world on the other side of this. And that's why I mm. think the Climate Assembly recommendations could be very powerful, mm. particularly as, you know, they've happened um, overlapping with lockdown. Mm. Because, you know, we, we might have argued for years that the commute was insane. Mm. And yes. it's, it's only by yeah. breaking the commute mm. that, you know, everyone, I mean, I know this, mm. in my own agency, you know, the argument was like, oh, you know, people can't do four day weeks. People can't be trusted to work from home. Mm. Mm. You know, people can't, we can't run workshops remotely. We've got yeah. to fly people all over the place. Mm. Um, you know, and I would always be a sort of resistant force to those type of arguments. And then suddenly, mm. you know, you get something like a pandemic and, Everyone's working from home. Yes. Admitted it's not perfect for everyone. Um, you know, we're doing workshops virtually. You know, the world didn't fall apart mm. in, in that respect. So I think 
somehow we have to sell the benefits of that re radical relocalization. Mm -hmm. And I think there is a lot of joy um, and inspiration to be had in that, yes. particularly when it's removing things that people perhaps didn't particularly like. I wonder if you mm -hmm. saw the, the death hole advert that's been doing the rounds, you mm -hmm. know, like yes. trying to celebrate the Canute on the London Tube. It's yeah. like, okay. your boss's jokes. Oh, oh, and it's like, yeah. a, Nobody likes any of those thing. things. Yes. You know, we're all actually secretly relieved. We don't have yes. to yeah, you know, no, go it's through all of those. On note. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. I, I, yeah, I, I do think, I mean, and it comes back to that point you were making earlier about interventions. There is an intervention here. Mm. And there are other interventions, which is creating these radical creative spaces for mm. different possibilities. Yeah. And actually, I think the first XR um, demonstrations mm. at Oxford Circus and stuff yeah. were exactly that type of joyful disruption. Yes, yes. Because people were like, and that's what you know initially built the ground at the well. beginning. Yes. Yeah, it was a great empathic connection for people mm. going, oh wow, it's a carnival yeah. of mm. possibility. Yes. And I think we need more carnivals of possibility. Yes. Yeah, and possibility seems such a good important word because when people tell you that things are impossible, sort of why are they telling what's to gain what do they gain from telling you it's impossible? Because we've found out now that lots of things we were told were impossible are perfectly possible. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And usually the people who are telling you it's yeah. impossible are people who are going to lose a lot by yeah. the transition. <laughs> yeah. Now it's yeah. a classic. Exactly. That's the classic thing. There's, that a, lot, is all it there's is. a lot of losers. It's that simple. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful job, you guys. This has been absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for being on this call today. This is amazing. I, I can ask you one more question if you have time, um, but otherwise I, I'm happy to, to send the questions to you. I've been telling the whole group. Um, I'll send the questions to you, Anushka, and, and you know get anything that we miss answered via a blog post. Yeah, I'd love it. Great. Okay, so if you have time for one more question, um, we we have, and this is the last one. There's a question from uh, Leone Guest. You talk about transcendence, and I'm wondering what that transcendence looks like to you both. What is it that we need to transcend? Hmm. Oh, yeah. That's my fault. I dropped that word in. Um, I mean, f for me, you know, it partly is this sort of bigger than self compassion. Mm -hmm. You know, that I am. A, a part of that wider sea of humanity and the wider family of life. Mm. But, but equally, I've been doing a lot of work um, with, uh, with myth, mm. you know, the sort of precursors of a lot of the sort of union, um, you know, archetypes and, mm. and psychoanalysis. And what, what I've been fascinated by is actually most of the insights that we need actually exist in some of our oldest stories. Mm. Um, and they've actually been part of you know, human culture and society for thousands of years. Mm. And, and almost we've forgotten those, yes. those stories and we've overlaid them mm. with layers of sophistry and complexity. And so mm. for me, the transcendence has actually been about reconnecting to our oldest wisdom. Um, and, you know, and I don't mm. mean that necessarily in a kind of, you know, noble savage type of way, mm. but actually that almost every indigenous culture on the planet understands the indivisibility and interdependence and interconnectedness of life mm. in a holistic, yes, holistic yeah, yeah. way that we are so desperately in mm. need of now. Yes. And so for me, that transcendence is overcoming, you know, the schism of, of separation mm. and, and getting back to that reconnection with the oldest stories in yeah. the world. I agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> but also, maybe you, it's like you need to break yourself open in a way that doesn't hurt. And then, yeah, yeah. I don't know, something like that. <laughs> Thank you. It's so oh. lovely to see people's faces, to see friends' faces, and it's been very exciting. <laughs> this has been amazing. Thank you guys for joining us on the, the uh, on tonight's call. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you so you. much for, for being there. Hey, Hannah. Thank you so much for writing the book. <laughs>